Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, women here in Germany should stop moaning about all the injustices they face, should stop hiding behind their husbands and their children and should start working harder and being braver, enforcing their way to the top of the career ladder and shaping the world in which they live. So at least says my guest today and here she is, the prominent journalist Basha Mika. Hello. Welcome to Talking Germany. Great to have you here. Now, earlier this year, Basha Mika raised a lot of eyebrows with her book, The Cowardice of Women. Yes, cowardice was the word. Uh, before that, she was for over a decade the editor-in-chief of Germany's leading left-wing newspaper called Die Tats. And she is, by the way, an honorary professor at one of our local universities here in Berlin. So I'm sure we can very much look forward to hearing what she has to say about the following topics. Stirring things up, Basha Mika certainly doesn't shy away from conflict and has made quite a name for herself as a woman who goes against the grain. The equality paradox, yes, says our studio guest. In theory, women have equal rights with men, but too many women, she argues, are clinging to traditional roles. And church at the crossroads. Basha is also critical of the Catholic Church, which she grew up in and which faces some huge challenges. Basha Mika, welcome once again. We have some big, big topics to talk about here. But what I want to begin with, first of all, is a quote. And it's a quote that I took from a German newspaper and it describes you. Here we go. Basha Mika is well known as a specialist in the art of provocation. <laughs> <laughs> is that a fair comment, Basha? I'm not sure I'd say I'm a specialist, but as a journalist, I do know how to provoke. And provocation is often necessary to attract attention. I don't mean provocation in the sense of tabloid journalism. Tabloids provoke in a way I wouldn't want to do. Is there, though, would you say there's something in your character that leads you to be a little bit of a, to engage in provocation? I think so, yes. I'm only 1 meter 54 tall. As a relatively short woman, if I want to attract any sort of attention at all, I have to know how to present myself, and provocation is a part of that. <laughs> okay, uh, there's an organization here in Germany, and it is called the Society for the German Language. And each year, uh, it announces what it believes is the word of the year in the German language, and normally that sheds some light on things that are going mm -hmm. on in Germany. Uh, the word last year, we haven't had this year's word yet, uh, the word last year was Wutbürger. Uh, and in one review I read about you and your latest book, you were described as an angry, as a Wutbürger, which is an angry or enraged citizen. What kind of things do you get angry about? There are a lot of things about our society that do make me angry. With respect to women, what I truly find upsetting is that women set aside the things they really want, their goals for the future, their hopes and dreams. Women start out saying these things are important, but then they don't make them happen. I think the term Wutbürger is quite derogatory, actually. Here in Germany, we are too obedient and too conformist. We don't take to the streets often enough, and we don't protest things nearly enough. For example, if you look at the United States, there are massive protests underway about banking policies. Here in Germany, no one has taken to the streets. So in that sense, I do believe we need some angry citizens, and we need them out in public, out on the streets. Okay. Let's go back to your very early days. At the end of the 50s, your family came from Poland to Germany. How did you, how did you fit in? Did you fit in? Well, I didn't have any problems with the language. My family was bilingual, so when we came to Germany, that wasn't a problem. But I did have difficulty with the mentality. My family came from the East, and we ended up all the way in the West, in Aachen. For those of you who don't know the city, it's a fairly large city near Cologne. 
Aachen does have something of that Rhineland mentality, even if it's not quite that. As a child, that was very foreign to me. And how did you cope with that? I withdrew a bit. For example, in Aachen, people spoke a dialect called Plattdeutsch. I refused to do that. Even today, I still can't speak it. That was a small, a very small form of protest. I was also left with a touch of sadness, the kind of sadness many children are left with when they move away at a young age. When they have to leave their friends behind and go somewhere completely different, they have that leftover sadness. That's also why I tend to refer to the former Upper Silesia as my icy homeland. It was minus 27 degrees Celsius when I was born. <laughs> and then, so you moved, after that, you moved away from Aachen after you'd finished school. You came, you moved, you moved into journalism, as we saw in the, in the report, and you, you began to work at Germany's left-wing, prominent left-wing newspaper, mm -hmm. Die Tats. Just tell uh, our audience a little bit more about the Tats. The Tats, or the Tageszeitung, wasn't founded as a newspaper, but as a political project. That was in the late 1970s, when Germany was teeming with alternative leftist initiatives. But the Tats was the only newspaper founded after the war, and it was also the largest alternative medium at the time. During the 1980s, the paper was professionalized and turned into a real daily newspaper. In the early 1990s, 1990s, new structures were put into place and it became a cooperative. It recreated itself as a company and instituted hierarchies. Part of that was the new position of editor-in-chief. And you didn't just work at the Tats, you became the editor-in-chief and you stayed the editor-in-chief for over a decade. Yeah? And one of the topics we're talking about today is women and power. How did you cope with power? How did you deal with having power? Power is wonderful because it allows you to make decisions. Power isn't really what many women think it is. Women sometimes say power is distasteful and they don't want to sully themselves. They want to keep their hands clean, so to speak. But actually, power just means that you're in a position of influence, that you can make decisions, including decisions as a woman. That's why it's so very important that women overcome their resistance to power. If you're powerful, after all, you can define what power means. Define it yourself. Okay, Basha, let's, uh, after listening to that lot, we've got to begin with first principles. Um, how emancipated are women in Germany? Most German women believe they're emancipated. Over half of German women say they want to be independent, to determine the course of their own lives. That's what women say when they're just starting out. But unfortunately, many women still end up assuming a traditional role. I do think it's extremely important for us to take a good hard look at ourselves. How do women behave in those areas where they have a lot of decision-making power, meaning in the private sphere? Women have much less decision-making power in areas that are dominated by rigid structures and dominated by men. That includes much of work life and the political sphere. But in their private lives, women can in fact make decisions and they still end up drifting into traditional roles, even women who say that's not what they want. If a woman says that is exactly what she wants, that what she wants is to take care of her husband and family and children, then it's perfectly okay. <laughs> All well and good. We're talking here, though, very abstractly about whether women are emancipated or not, in inverted commas. As I say, very abstract. Are you emancipated? Tiles, tiles. <laughs> yes and no. I would say yes in part, but only because I know how much pressure women still face to adopt traditional roles. I wrote the book Die Feigheit der Frauen, The Cowardice of Women, because I'm very aware of my own cowardice. That's why in the book I don't talk about women as such, but instead talk about us and we. If there's a lot of pressure on women pushing them in the direction of traditional role models, role patterns. Is that something that is specifically German or are we talking more sort of European or globally here? 
Also, ich glaube, wir können durch I do think this is a European issue, if we're talking about the fact that women are still being shunted into traditional roles. But the pressure to take on traditional roles varies by country. In Germany, it's definitely a lot more intense than in Finland or in France, especially when you look at issues like how women are integrating motherhood into their personal and their work lives. Now, we're going to tackle a slightly different subject, but just as controversial, I can tell you. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI has recently been in Germany on a state visit that was declared a resounding success by the Catholic Church. But the fact that large crowds gathered to welcome the Pope couldn't hide the other fact that Germany's Catholic Church is a church in crisis, as we see now. The Catholic Church here in Duisburg died a slow and painful death. A wooden cross is all that remains of the church that once stood here in the district of Buchholz. The brickwork church is being replaced by new townhouses. The small parish was merged with a larger one, which has only one priest for a congregation of about 30,000. These days, Catholicism is languishing under the weight of large and anonymous parishes and scandals about past child abuse within the church. It's sobering that it's not being talked about. The lack of priests, the question of celibacy, and of women in the priesthood. The numbers show we soon won't have any new priests who will be able to lead our few remaining parishes. Around 180,000 people formerly left the Catholic Church last year in Germany. The number of Catholics is dwindling. Some traditionalists even support the church's decline. They'd rather have a small church than one that conforms to modern times. But critics say this approach is unwise. The church has the duty to help shape our world instead of withdrawing from it. And if it retreats to the small core of traditional religion, then it will become something that can be safely ignored. It will be a sect irrelevant to society at large. But for some people, Catholicism is still relevant today. At St. Hedwig's in Berlin, a group of adults are preparing to join the church. They believe change will come from within. If you want to criticize something or create change, you need to enter into a dialogue with it instead of hammering away from the outside. So if I see something worth criticizing, which of course I do, then I want to talk to other people within the community about it. They wanted to talk in Duisburg, but no one wanted to listen. And a once thriving parish is no more. Lots of things to talk about here too, Basha. Uh, you grew up in the Catholic Church and we've, we've just been listening about this mountain of problems that the church is confronted by. How much sympathy do you have for the church? I don't have much sympathy for the institution as such, but I do have sympathy for religious people. The yearning for spirituality isn't just growing in Germany, it's growing across the world. I still think, and we saw it in the report, that the Catholic Church is driving away its own members with its conservative policies. Mm. Let's just talk about you, first of all. How, how Catholic are you? Because, I mean, the, 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 there is the saying, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> how much does that apply to you, with your Polish background, after all? Yeah. When you're raised a strict Catholic, you can never entirely unlearn that. Catholicism becomes something that's part of you. To some extent, to be honest, I'm not opposed to that. A certain kind of moral framework, a concept of right and wrong, and a concept of justice, I think my Catholic upbringing did promote that, and I'm grateful for that. But I don't approve of all the coercion that's involved, all the moral pressure the institution tries to hammer into us. The church needs to modernize or it will die out. Let's talk about that in just a second, but let's talk again, once, uh, once again about you. It's very interesting. In the country where I grew up, in the UK, 
people don't sort of, there's, there's no real paperwork involved in leaving the church. You just stop going. But here in Germany, you did leave the church. Mm -hmm. That is a problem that the church is confronted with. How does that, how do, how does that actually happen in Germany? Um, man muss das richtig schriftlich, um, you have to put it in writing um, that you want to leave the church. It's an administrative act. That's also because we pay a church tax, and the state collects this tax for the two major established churches. I still pay the church tax for the Protestant church because I think it's important. The churches run many social projects, so I'm happy to pay a church tax to support that. But I don't have anything to do with the Protestant church as an institution. I'm much too Catholic for that. And let's talk, we've been talking about the role of women in German society. What exactly is it that German women, German Catholic women want from the Catholic Church and why is the Catholic Church not listening? There are two things that are important for German women, Catholic women. The first is abolishing the celibacy of the priesthood. The second is admitting women to the priesthood. After all, women carry out most of the work of the church, most of the charitable work, and they get nothing for it. They're good enough to clean the churches, but they aren't good enough to stand behind the altar. That's unacceptable, really. But for Catholic women in Germany, it's more than just the insulting fact that they're not allowed to join the priesthood. It's also the issue of priestly celibacy, which implies that women aren't even worthy of being at a priest's side. Das suggeriert ihnen, ihr Frauen seid es noch nicht mal wert, an der Seite eines Priesters zu leben. Okay, and just one more point I want to touch on, because one of the one of the criticisms from 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 the Pope, Pope Benedict, when he was here in Germany, it's been a constant theme of the Popes, is that people in the modern world are too materialistic, too individualistic, and if people leave the church, if people turn away from the church, where do they get their values from? That's why I think religious education is important and meaningful. But the Pope has no right to complain about the fact that people are turning their backs on the Church and maybe even refusing the part of it that's about teaching values. That's the logical outcome of these backwards-looking retrograde policies. He's driving away modern, enlightened people and trying to turn them into slaves to authority. It just won't work. Okay. Um, before we before we wind up, I'd just like to talk to about you about your book again, and I'd like to talk about the reaction to your book in German society because I know that you've been out and about. You've been doing an awful lot of readings, mm -hmm. lots and lots of readings. Hard work for you, yeah. But what what, what have you learned from the people who have come to those readings? My book is a polemic, but even though I frame it in a provocative way, it's interesting that women don't just come to the readings and attack me. Quite the opposite. Even women who don't agree with my basic standpoint always emphasize how important it is that we continue to engage in these debates. How important it is that we talk to each other as women and talk about what we can do to promote equality in our society. And, of course, there are many women who come to me and say, Frau Mika, I read your book and I felt like you were writing about me. We began by talking about you as a, as a, as a, a specialist in the art of uh, provocation. Yeah? Have you got another controversial topic up your sleeve that you're working on as your next controversial theme? Um, <laughs> I wish I could tell you, but I don't think I should. It's important to hang on to our little secrets until they're good and ready. Okay, we'll have to wait and see. If you've enjoyed the show today with Basha Mika and you want to find out a little bit more about uh, the behind-the-scenes encounter, then you might want to read my blog on the Talking Germany website and please do also post your comments. If you're into Talking Germany, you can find out more on the internet. Your host, Peter Craven, is keeping a blog on the many shows and guests in the series. Find out more about what happens behind the scenes, gossip, experiences, how the whole show is put together. Just visit blog.dw-world.de slash Talking Germany. And you can tell us what you think about the program there, too. OK, quiz time. Relatively quick questions, relatively quick answers, please, Basher, at the end of the show here. Confrontation or compromise? 
Konfrontation. Confrontation. Oh. <laughs> well, if, you, if there's so much confrontation in your professional life, are you thick-skinned or are you thin-skinned? Um, Dünnhäutig. Thin-skinned. Ah, yeah, so it can hurt you sometimes when those reviews are written of your books. <laughs> yeah. uh, who would you rather have as a boss, a man or a woman? Women. <laughs> Why? Um... It's hard to explain. It would slow us down too much. Has the financial crisis made you more of a lefty or less of a lefty? More to the left, of course. The ideas like the tax on financial transactions are the only way for us to move forward. I'm with you all the way. Yeah, OK, the, that's the angry citizen, yeah? Basha Mika, she's been a very good guest. If you've enjoyed her uh, company as much as I have, then do come back next week. And uh, let me just remind you that you can, of course, watch any of our shows that you have missed or want to watch again. You'll find them all on the Talking Germany archive. Until next week, bye-bye and tschüss.